Thank you for joining us today for this special presentation of the Stanford Medicine webcast, Infertility and Fertility Preservation. I'm Mary Windischar, today's moderator, and our program is live from the Stanford University campus in Palo Alto, California. Discussing today's topic, we have Dr. Ruth Lottie and Dr. Valerie Baker. Dr. Lottie is an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Stanford University Medical Center. She's the founder and director of the Multispecialty Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Program at Stanford University and has been nationally recognized for her research in the field of infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss. Dr. Baker is the chief of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility, as well as medical director of the Stanford Fertility and Reproductive Medicine Center. Her clinical and research interests include ovarian stimulation protocols in assisted reproductive technology, factors affecting success with fertility treatment, and premature ovarian failure. It's okay to laugh when I mess up these terms. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to say welcome to both Dr. Lottie and Dr. Baker. And Dr. Lottie, you're starting out with our first presentation today. Thank you, Mary. And as physicians in reproductive medicine, we really feel that prevention and education is a first line for helping women and families um, with fertility. So I'll start today by giving you a brief overview of uh, what women should know as they're beginning their journey to start a family. So let's get started. The, we're gonna go over a few objectives today. One, what I think women uh, should know as they prepare for pregnancy. What are those important uh, points? What, when, would she, when should we worry about our fertility? Is it now or is it after six months or six years? And if you're concerned about your fertility, what should you do if you need or think you need, might need some support? So let's start with preparing for a pregnancy. Step one, get healthy. We know that the outcome of any pregnancy will be dependent on the um, health of the mother at the time of conception. So a lot of the things that we do um, before pregnancy to get healthy can really increase the chance of having a healthy and successful pregnancy. So some basic things that um, I tell all my patients to uh, get started, eat right, have a healthy diet. One of the simplest things we can do is increase the number of fruits and vegetables in our diet. Uh, exercise is a really important point and part of a healthy lifestyle. We recommend at least 30 minutes every day um, or as many days as possible during the week. Uh, other lifestyle things that um, are important to keep in mind is that we want to moderate alcohol and caffeine intake, stop smoking. We know that um, some of these um, ingestions can lead to longer uh, periods to conceive and potentially higher rates of complications in pregnancy. And then um, the, last, the last point that I have on this slide here is to achieve a healthy normal weight. Being either underweight or overweight can lead to difficulties in conceiving and also complications in pregnancy. So a BMI is um, abbreviation for body mass index and it's a ratio of height to weight. It's not that everybody needs to weigh 120 pounds or 150 pounds. Depends on how tall you are, what the right healthy weight is for you. But it is important to try to achieve a um, healthy weight before pregnancy for best outcomes. In addition to just getting healthy, it's important to see your doctor. There are some things that we'd like to make sure are up to date before a woman gets pregnant. Um, not Most of these things can be achieved or um, we can catch up during pregnancy, but it's always better to be prepared and start a pregnancy right. So we wanna make sure that everybody's up to date on their vaccines, pap smears, mammograms, other health maintenance checks that are necessary. Um, Medical conditions should be optimally controlled before a woman conceives. This is particularly important for women who have things like thyroid disorder, diabetes, um, other medical disorders that require medications. Um, as a general rule, most medications are safe to take in pregnancy, but not all. And sometimes medications should be adjusted before or during the early parts of pregnancy for certain medical conditions. So that's another important part and component of seeing your doctor. So discuss that with your physician before you get pregnant. Um, additionally, in preparing for a healthy pregnancy, uh, there, may be, you, there may be some genetic testing that you'd like to undergo. So we, we have some guidelines and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has guidelines, many guidelines about the types of genetic carrier screening that are needed um, or recommended for a couple who are considering pregnancy. And the, the basis of this recommendation is that perfectly healthy people can carry traits for genetic disorders and be completely unaware of it. So this is not testing um, 
patients for to see if they have the disease, but if they have a trait for the disease. And as we kind of remember back to high school biology, if two, cup, two um, individuals who both carry a similar trait have, uh, have a baby, then that baby could be infected if they inherit two traits. So even perfectly healthy couples who don't or are unaware of any genetic problems may want to seek um, preconception genetic carrier screening. And then there are certain ethnicity um, based recommendations or groups that are at higher risk. So ask your doctor about that if you're concerned or interested. And then ultimately begin prenatal vitamins. Uh, taking an adequate intake of folic acid can reduce the incidence of certain birth defects uh, in pregnancy, but it's important that these supplements be initiated prior to conceiving. So what do we do when we're trying to get pregnant? Um, what does that mean? Um, does it just mean, you know, pull the goalie or stop your birth control and then instantly you'll be pregnant? Um, no, it doesn't actually mean that. We need to um, be aware of what our fertile windows are and know that fertility actually peaks three to five days before ovulation. Many couples who um, are trying to be proactive in time their intercourse to ovulation are waiting too long in the cycle. And later in the cycle, uh, couples are not quite as fertile as if they were to start trying to conceive prior to ovulation. There are certain petroleum-based um, lubricants that may impair sperm function. And so I encourage couples who use uh, lubricants for sexual activity to do their research and pick one that's more fertility friendly. Uh, we recommend more frequent intercourse in the days prior to ovulation, and a frequency of approximately every one to two days is a pretty standard recommendation. Longer periods of abstinence do not improve sperm quality, and in fact can actually reduce sperm function and quality if the period of abstinence gets too long. And then lastly, sexual positioning doesn't matter, so that doesn't uh, need to change. So how do we know when we're ovulating? I mentioned our fertile window is within a few days of ovulation. How do we know? Um, the simplest way is to know what your normal cycle length is. If a, a, a typical cycle length may be every 28 to 30 days, a monthly cycle, you can count backwards, 14 days, and that's the approximate day of ovulation. So the simplest, lowest tech way is to just count. Uh, in a 28-day cycle, you're like, ovulating about day 14. If the cycles are longer, it may be later in the cycle. But there are several base, simple ways to detect ovulation if you're not sure. Some women will track symptoms such as um, cervical or vaginal secretions. Uh, other women can check their basal body temperature charts and there are also several over-the-counter ovulation predictor kits that can be used. So as we begin to uh, try to conceive, a lot of times people say, how long does it take? How, how many months before I should start worrying? We know that the approximate, in a healthy couple, about 20% will conceive per month for the first three months, which statistically adds up to about half of couples uh, with normal fertility will conceive within the first three months. About three quarters will conceive within six months, and 85% will conceive within the first year. And that's where the diagnosis, the technical diagnosis of infertility um, is reached. After one year of unprotected intercourse, um, the definition of infertility is made. So when do we need to ask for help? Is it, do we all, does everybody have to wait a year and meet that di technical diagnosis of infertility before they ask for help? And the simple answer is no. You should always ask for help whenever you're concerned about fertility. Um, a general recommendation is to give it a one year of trying if you're less than 35. And for women over age 35, if it's been over six months or longer, to start to seek um, advice. Um, However, if there's something concerning in the past medical history of either partner, a past history of cancer treatment, a past history of infertility with a different partner, and then things that we really want to investigate sooner are for women who have irregular menstrual cycles or a history of any gynecologic problems that may affect fertility, things like fibroids, ovarian cysts, endometriosis. So um, if there's a prior gynecologic history, it's always good to ask up front, is this going to affect my future fertility? And how do I get help? How does a couple get help if they need it? I always recommend start with the doctor you know. It's easier. They know you. They're, they care for you. So start with your primary care physician or your gynecologist and ask the question, when should I be treated? When should I be evaluated? And um, follow their advice initially. 
If, however, the primary care physician or gynecologist is um, unable to help or is success, the, you're unable to achieve success with that route, then um, a referral to a specialist may be indicated. And the, the type of specialist you need is something called a reproductive endocrinologist, like Dr. Baker and myself um, are specially trained OBGYNs who did additional um, postdoctoral training in fertility. So if we decide to embark on the fertility journey and the, or the infertility evaluation, I just have a slide here to go over the basic normal reproductive process. The sperm has to travel through the vagina, up through the cervix, into the fallopian tubes where it meets the egg and the fertilized egg travels back through the fallopian tubes and implants in the uterus. So a lot of things have to go right for fertility and uh, implantation and a pregnancy to be established. The infertility evaluation is geared at just at identifying problems with any of those steps. There's an evaluation of the male with a semen analysis, an evaluation of the woman both with regard to ovarian function uh, and anatomy. After a diagnosis of infertility, there's always a decision made about do we need treatment, and if so, what treatments are there available for me. Uh, I'm going to take just a few minutes to give a brief overview just to demystify and to give some uh, basic information about some of the treatments that we offer to help couples who are suffering from infertility. Um, so there are treatments that can help fertility um, through ovulation induction. They're typically reserved for a, a woman who may have irregular periods or is not ovulating on her own. So fertility medications alone can be used. Uh, however, we often are looking at um, other treatments that might involve intrauterine insemination um, or in vitro fertilization. And I'll go over each of those here briefly. Intrauterine insemination or IUI um, can be performed with or without fertility enhancing medications. And it is a, a simple non-invasive procedure to help to deliver more high quality sperm to the upper uh, female genital tract at or near the time of ovulation. And from a female perspective, what it, it, the experience is similar to what you'd experience during a pap smear. A speculum is placed uh, and the catheter is introduced into the cervix to inject the sperm um, into the upper uterine cavity. It's, it's, um, it's not too uncomfortable. It not, does not require an anesthesia and um, typically tolerated very well by our patients, then takes just a few minutes. So patients are back to their normal activities within minutes after having an insemination. In vitro fertilization, or IVF, is a little bit more involved procedure. We would generally reserve it for um, special cases of more advanced infertility or severe infer fertility factors. It involves more steps, um, listed here. The first is that fertility enhancing medications are typically used to increase the number of eggs that are produced at a given time. Uh, there is a procedure that is done to extract the, the eggs um, from the ovaries and that's done transvaginally. So there are no sutures or major surgery, but it is a little bit more invasive than just a pap smear. The eggs are fertilized in our laboratory and then replaced back into the uterine cavity. Um, with the hopes that they will implant. While the embryos are in the laboratory, we do have an option to test embryos for genetic disease um, and make genetic diagnosis to help determine which embryos are most likely to implant. This is not a standard part of in vitro fertilization, but it is a very exciting development in our field where we have this opportunity to help uh, reduce the burden of certain genetic dis disorders if that's what a, a couple is, is interested in doing. So pre-implantation genetic testing of embryos involves uh, allowing the, fertilizing the eggs in the laboratory through in vitro fertilization and then testing embryos for genetic diseases. Anything that we can test an adult for, a genetic marker or a genetic uh, disease, we can test an embryo for. It has to be something we can genetically identify with a test, but the list is expanding rapidly. And we frequently do genetic testing of embryos for things like Tay-Sachs disease, sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis. We can also test for age-related chromosome abnormalities with the use of pre-implantation genetic testing of embryos. Again, as I mentioned, this is not a standard part of in vitro fertilization, but many of our couples are, and families are choosing to do this uh, based on their past history. 
So I want to just conclude my part, part of today's session with, with um, some basic messages that I want everyone to hear today. Um, with regard to taking control of your fertility, be prepared. Think about it ahead of time and get ready. Be informed and get help if you need it. So I, uh, there are many, many treatment options available. So even if you are having tr trouble, there's a lot of things we can do to help couples achieve their dreams and goals of starting a family. Thank you, Dr. Lottie. Now we get to hear from Dr. Baker. Welcome, Dr. Baker. It's a real privilege to be able to address you today and, and to be able to be uh, uh, speaking with uh, Mary and Dr. Lottie. Um, I'm gonna be talking for just a few minutes about the biological clock. The first question is really, what is a biological clock for fertility? We often hear this term, and, and uh, you may have heard it uh, many times and, and thought about it. Um, a lot of people understand that there's a decline in fertility with age, mainly for women, and that's what most people are referring to when they say the biological clock. If you look at this slide, you can see that um, for most women in their, in their 20s, an expected fertility rate per cycle, a chance of having a, a successful pregnancy somewhere around 20 to 25 percent. Uh, what, what Dr. Lati mentioned. But as we get into our 30s, um, the, the fertility will drop such that women may have a 10 or 15 percent chance of, of conceiving, even if both the woman and her partner are really fertile. By age 40, most people are kind of surprised to realize that a normal fertile couple who's even previously had children together, for example, will drop down to about a 5% chance per, per month of getting pregnant. And by the time we're in our mid-40s, even a fertile couple has, has, has about a 1% chance per month. We understand that this is mainly due to a, a problem with ovarian aging. If you look on this slide, across the x-axis you can see women's age, and on the y-axis is success rate with in vitro fertilization. These are national data. The blue, the blue line shows you that what the success is for, for women who are using an egg donor. So this is typically someone under 30 who has, uh, who has uh, donated the eggs and the woman who will be the mother of the child is carrying those eggs. So it really doesn't matter if the woman's 30, 40, 45. She has really the same rate of pregnancy. She's able to carry just as well when she's 45, essentially, as when she's 35. What really drops off and causes the, the drop in fertility with age is the age of the egg. Uh, and, and as uh, you can see, paralleling the natural drop in fertility that you see for couples just trying on their own, even with in vitro fertilization, that same drop in fertility occurs. It occurs largely during the 30s. And then by age uh, 40, um, you can see, see a lower rate. And by 45, even with in vitro fertilization, the success rate of having a baby per, per uh, cycle is about 1%. There are different uh, stages of ovarian aging. So if you look in the middle, we, we depicted on the schematic uh, average rate of aging. So a woman uh, starting around age 30 will start to have some drop in her egg quality and egg number. And then she goes through probably a more steeper decline into her 30s and, and mid, up to mid 40s. Um, but some women are unlucky. They're born with fewer eggs or maybe their rate of loss of eggs per month is, is greater. And then some women might get more lucky and have uh, been born with more eggs or perhaps uh, lose them at a slower rate. So, so women really are not all on the same biological clock. Commonly a term is used called ovarian reserve, which refers to the quality and quantity of oocytes or eggs, that, and this also correlates with fertility potential. Really what we're able to do is, as healthcare providers is assess what a woman's quantity is. And so we also know though with age, both the quality and the quantity decrease. And as a woman gets older, another thing that's affecting age is not, is, is affecting fertility is not just the the sense that there are fewer eggs left, but that there's a greater chance that an egg will have the wrong number of chromosomes, and that's often uh, termed aneuploidy. How can we assess ovarian reserve? Um, so we can, we can ask a woman to have a blood test for the hormone FSH, or follicle-stimulating hormone, and estradiol on the third day of her menstrual cycle. Uh, with age, the uh, FSH level will rise. 
Uh, and as the egg supply drops, the FSH level rises. We can do an ultrasound uh, and look at the antral follicle count. So in this picture, what you see is an oval-shaped structure that has some black little circles in it. And those black circles are ovarian follicles. They're small sacs of fluid that in each wall of the follicle uh, is a microscopic egg. And what we see is when a woman's egg supply is very good, her body will show uh, uh, many eggs being offered up for grabs each month. They're being put into this recruitable pool and can be visualized by ultrasound. We can't see the eggs because they're microscopic, but we can see these, these follicles. As a woman's egg supply drops in her ovary, so does her antral follicle count. And so fewer of those little black circles will be, will be visible when we do an ultrasound. Uh, a commonly used blood test now um, that's somewhat newer is called anti-malarian hormone, or AMH. This is made by those little follicles in the ovary. And as a woman's egg supply drops, this blood test uh, will show that the AMH level is dropping as well. So I'd like to take just a minute to give you a chance to think about what, what do you know about, uh, about reproductive aging. And we, had, we administered this uh, quiz online to, four, um, Bay Area, to women in four Bay Area universities. So the first question, um, women are born with all the eggs they'll ever have. Uh, is that true or false? The answer's true. Next question, um, smoking reduces egg supply. Answer is true about the question, women can consider freezing eggs before cancer treatment. The answer to that is true. Nearly all the women um, who took this uh, questionnaire in the, uh, among four Bay Area universities got these, the answers to these questions right. But some of them were a little bit more difficult. Uh, an example, diet and exercise will preserve egg supply. Unfortunately, it's false. And, and one of the things that Dr. Lati and I see most frequently is uh, a woman who has taken perfectly good care of herself. She's in excellent health. Uh, she's had a healthy diet. She exercises. She doesn't smoke. And yet her egg supply is low, and she had no idea. And, and so although healthy lifestyle does help with general overall fertility, it unfortunately, just by itself, doesn't, doesn't protect against a potential drop in egg supply. How about the high-tech option of IVF? Uh, will that allow women who can conceive, even if their egg supply is very low? And I've kind of already given you the answer to that, but unfortunately, that answer is also, also false. Once the egg supply drops very, very low, although it's still possible that IVF will be successful, even the very, very high-tech tech options uh, don't re uh, reverse that ovarian aging. Can we stop the biological clock with cryopreservation or freezing? There are a number of ways that we can do uh, fertility preservation uh, by freezing. One of them, as you see on the left, is to freeze embryos. And this has been done for decades very, very successfully. You can see this is an embryo with multiple cells visible. And, and it has been possible for a woman, if she has a current partner or if she's willing to um, have a sperm donor, uh, to, freeze, to freeze embryos. A more common option now for fertility preservation is to freeze mature eggs, um, and we'll talk some more about that in just a moment. Um, it's also possible to freeze ovarian tissue, although, and we have done this at Stanford, but this is a more experimental approach. And it's also possible to, to freeze immature eggs, Im and immature eggs um, are retrieved when a woman has not gone through fertility medications uh, prior to having those, those eggs recovered. So, so as I mentioned, freezing of mature eggs has become the most popular option for fertility preservation because it doesn't require that a woman have a partner currently. Some couples, even if they're in a well-established relationship, have ethical cons concerns about freezing embryos. Um, and they, they really prefer the option of freezing eggs if they're just not unable, uh, if they're unable to have a, a child right, right at this time. And then, as in the past few years, we've gained more experience with egg freezing and I feel more confident that the methodologies are working. Why do women freeze their eggs? So some women have uh, decided to freeze eggs because they've just sadly recently got a diagnosis of cancer, and a woman may need chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery that's going to have a high chance of, of damaging her egg supply. Some women have personal reasons. They haven't met their life partner. Maybe they have other obligations, such as a, a career, education, or they're caring for other family members uh, who are requiring a lot, of, a lot of their attention. 
And then I'm seeing now more women who are aware that if they have a family history of premature ovarian failure or primary ovarian insufficiency, that they may also be, be at risk for that and they decide to freeze their eggs for that reason. Uh, a few years ago, a big breakthrough came uh, in egg freezing. So if you look on the left, um, the methodology that we had been using for decades was called a slow freeze. So the, the tissue would be gradually dropped in, in temperature using a programmable freezer. But there was a problem that ice crystals could form in the eggs, and, and many of the eggs didn't survive, or if they did survive, they really weren't, weren't viable. Uh, we now freeze eggs by a process called vitrification, which is basically the temperature taking a big, quick plunge, and that's been a much more successful method for freezing. So if you look at the survival rate with egg freezing, uh, it's improved with vitrification compared to slow freeze. So just the chance that an egg will make it through the freeze-thaw process has gone up a lot. The chance that the egg will fertilize once, once it's uh, survived the thaw has gone up with this method. And the pregnancy rate per egg um, has also gone up with, with the process of vitrification. And it's hard to think about this th in, a, in this way at first, but the, there's a chance that each egg could become a baby. And that is highly dependent on a woman's age when she's uh, freezing them. So if a woman freezes her eggs at 30, she has a much greater chance that one of those eggs will be viable than if she freezes her eggs at 40. Now, if she freezes her eggs at 40, it's probably still better than, for sure, than waiting till she's 45 if she's unable to have a, a child at the current time. But the sooner that um, eggs can be frozen, that overall is a, a, has a much better chance of working in the future. So egg freezing recently became uh, uh, receiving a designation as not being experimental. That only came about, about two years ago when one of our uh, professional organizations, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, lifted that experimental designation. We do have to acknowledge, though, that there are still limited data to allow us to accurately predict success rates for women who are electively freezing eggs. And commonly we're asked, well, how many eggs should I freeze? How many is enough? And in general, more is better um, because there's no guarantee that any one batch of eggs will contain the egg that can become the baby. Ideally, we say uh, a minimum of 10 to, to 20 eggs, but it, it really depends on how important that egg freezing process is for that woman meaning that if, if she realizes that, that it's very, very unlikely that, that she's going to be able to conceive during her fertile uh, period in life, she may want to uh, freeze more eggs than someone who is, is doing this uh, somewhat more electively. As I mentioned, primary ovarian insufficiency is a condition where eggs are depleted, and, and this is occurring way before a woman is expecting it, before the age of 40. This has also been called premature ovarian failure, and this condition can have a spectrum of health consequences, uh, such as irregular menses, hot flashes, vaginal dryness, bone loss. But sometimes the only presenting symptom or the only thing that a woman notices is that she's having difficulty conceiving. The diagnosis can be by history um, as well as by the blood test that I mentioned. Um, and sadly, most women who are given this diagnosis, it really just hits them completely by surprise. So an example might be someone who's on a birth control pill for a number of years, then goes off the pill to attempt conception, only to find out that her cycles are not returning, um, and that while she was on the birth control pill, uh, the egg supply had dropped. It's not that the birth control pills cause a drop in egg supplies, because they definitely do not, but it's while a woman's on the birth control pill, she will have regular periods just because of the, the pill itself. Um, other women come into our office and we do the ultrasound that I mentioned and, and sadly see very, very few of those small black circles, those antral follicles visible in the ovary, even though that woman is having clockwork normal menstrual cycles. So this can be a silent uh, condition where, where a woman has no idea that it's, that it's happening. Um, family building options for women with POI, um, the, the one has, that has uh, been uh, described the most has been oocyte donation, um, where the egg is, is coming from a, another woman, and so there's not really a genetic relationship to the child, but a woman can carry a pregnancy even after she, her eggs are depleted. 
Um, some women will still conceive even after their egg supply has dropped severely low, so we can, we can wait and hope that, that that happens. It's possible to have embryo donation or adoption to decide to choose not to have children. Very recently at Stanford, a few months ago, we began a treatment called in vitro activation. This is a highly experimental treatment where we, where we remove an ovary that is uh, uh, seeming to be uh, devoid of eggs and not uh, leading uh, to any ovulation. We take that tissue activated in the laboratory and then place the tissue back in the woman's body with the hope that some of the dormant eggs will be, be, be awoken. Um, in the entire world, there have only been two babies born, and we're the only center in the United States that's offering this treatment, and we just recently began. Uh, so this is really sort of a last resort, not something that, that we really hope that any of the, the listeners today would, would need to, to consider. And then if the diagnosis of dropping egg supply is made early, um, we can still freeze eggs um, before it's too late. The process of freezing eggs is about a two week long uh, uh, process. First of all, women learn to give uh, themselves uh, subcutaneous injections. And, and it's, unfortunately, it's still a needle, but at least it's a very, very small needle that's used um, for about 10 days. Then eggs are collected under anesthesia. And women don't feel this procedure at all um, because they have um, strong intravenous anesthesia that uh, allows us to do the procedure um, with, uh, with the woman being essentially asleep. But then it's a short acting um, anesthesia medicine so that it wears off quickly a woman can go home about an hour after the procedure, and then she can typically go back to work the next day. The procedure itself takes about 10 minutes, but um, a woman's typically there uh, having the, the egg retrieval process done for a total of about two hours, um, including the preparation before and recovery after. I'm really pleased to have had a chance to, to, to be part of this panel um, and to represent my colleagues uh, at, at Stanford Medicine, Fertility and Reproductive Health. Thank you very much, Dr. Baker. On behalf of Dr. Lottie and Dr. Baker, and of course our Stanford team here, thank you for joining us. I'm Mary Windeshar.